Well, today we're beginning a new series that I'm entitling Love is a Verb. Love is a Verb. So listen carefully. The quality of your life is determined by the quality of your relationships. Think about that statement for a moment. The quality of your life is determined by the quality of your relationships. You know, it's so profound in that end. Because why? Down deep inside of every single one of us is a desire to engage in relationships that are characterized by trust, loyalty, and devotion. It's a part of the fingerprint of God upon our soul. Because whether you're a Christian or not, every single human being was made in the image and the likeness of God. God created us for these types of relationships. That's why we crave them. That's why we long for them. That's why we look for them in every area. Because God is love and God created us for these types of relationships. And there's nothing that can satisfy our lives more. No more joy or fulfillment that we can experience but through healthy relationships. But you see, part of the problem is this. As much as we long for them, as much as we desire them, it's kind of like chronic dehydration. What do I mean by that? To stay hydrated, 75% of our body is water. And so medically speaking, they tell you that to be healthy, one of the most important components is that every one of us need to drink minimally eight eight ounce glasses of water a day. Because when our body is properly hydrated, we work at our optimal. We, uh, we resist disease, our, our, our bodies work as they're intended and created by God to do. But the problem is in a country like America, we are chronically dehydrated. In other words, most people don't drink that much water. And what happens is when you don't drink water as you do, your body goes into a survival mode. And so it does enough, but really what happens is it becomes a breeding ground for disease or other problems that we don't even recognize because most people aren't even conscious of the fact that they can be chronically dehydrated. And what happens is we try to drink other things, but the fact is there are certain things that we drink like coffee or soda that are diuretic. What do I mean by that is they actually take water out of our body, not put water into our body. And so if you're not recognizing of that front, it's like this. If you've had unhealthy relationships, we have kind of gone into a survival mode where we've had relationships in our lives, but the relationships many times we brought into our lives draw more out of us than ever put anything into us. And we're kind of in a state of really not recognizing what are healthy or unhealthy relationships. And as much as we crave the relationships, we long for those ends, Here's our problem. We live in a culture where relationships are expendable. In other words, when things get bad, people move on. Here's the motto in today's times for relationships. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. And really what we ask deep down inside, we may have never voiced this, this question, but we ask ourselves internally this question. Is it possible to remain for the long haul, to remain in relationships that are characterized by that love and trust, committed relationships, relationships that survive no matter what life sends its way, no matter what difficulties it faces. Is it possible to live and have long-term relationships this way? It kind of reminds me of a movie I watched years ago, and it's always dangerous to bring up a movie because, you know, there's always a good and a bad usually to most movies that are out there. So when I bring up one, it's not an endorsement to go out and watch it. But listen, there was a movie I watched years ago called Juno. And if you've ever seen the movie, it's about a teenage girl. And one of the most moving parts of the movie is she came to her father, and it's such a, 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 a special time because she said to her father she was going through difficulty she said dad I'm losing my faith in humanity she said dad is it possible that people can remain in relationships can they stay happy in relationships forever is that even possible is it even capable of end she'd see nothing but the brokenness of relationships in our world. And whether or not, that's what I want to in this series, address that issue. Because whether we've ever asked it out loud or whether it's just been something in our heart, is it possible to remain long-term in healthy relationships? 
Because again, the quality of our lives is determined by the quality of our relationships. But in our day, if we'd be honest about it, it's never been easier to engage in relationships. I mean, it's never been easier to find opportunities to to, uh, begin relationships, especially in the romantic way. Okay, there are over 1,500 websites out there today designed just to help you meet somebody on a romantic level. And here's the problem, okay? To fall in love only requires one thing. You know what that is? A pulse. But to remain in love, that's the challenge. And so in the course of this series, I want to help you at every level. It's designed to help relationships, whether they're friendships, family relationships, spouse relationships. We all need relationships. We all crave them. It's a part of being made in the image and the likeness of God. But can they remain? Because if you take your cues from culture, the unwritten rules of relationships and culture kind of go like this. You probably know them because, listen, they say things, that, it's like, do unto others as they deserve. Do unto others as they do unto you. Do unto others as your mood dictates. Do unto others until you manipulate them into doing what you want them to do. Do unto others until you wear them down and they give in to your demands. Do unto others so that they'll finally agree to see things your way. And those are kind of the unwritten rules. In fact, you add to that, in our current culture, we have an intolerance for every level of disappointment. And we have this, this uh, uh, low threshold of relational pain. So in our current culture, if the problems arise in any area on those fronts, we're willing to dump relationships and try to start a new one. And so in the midst of that, with situations that way, can relationships remain? Because the first casualty of a fallen human race was relational fallout. Immediately when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, the very first realities that manifested was this. The relationships became characterized by hiding, which created mistrust and, 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 and the idea that somehow, some way, we weren't going to be open. We weren't going to allow ourselves to be vulnerable or exposed. And they were characterized by relationships that engaged in hurt and blaming one another. And so often when you deal with relationships in our current culture, people look at other people and say, they're the reason why it's not working out. They're the problem. And we're constantly in that finger pointing, blame game, commitment. Because why? It began right from the beginning. The fallout started by putting, it's reversing the order of God. Instead of putting others first, we put our own needs before the relationship needs. And here's the reality. No matter how hard we try, no matter how noble our intentions may be, if we go into relationships putting our needs above all else, no matter how much we desire that relationship to remain, it will eventually fold because it won't be strong enough to support that end. Why? Why? Top psychologists today, listen to this. Top psychologists today in our uh, uh, day say this. To have a healthy psyche, and this is something that Kathy and I learned just a few years ago. Truthfully, as much as I've been in the Bible, because you know why? People expect in relationships someone else to fill a need that they feel is missing in their lives. But see, healthy relationships are achieved by two healthy people coming together. Because why? Nobody can do for you what only God can do. For you. And so top psychologists say to have a healthy psyche. And it's amazing to me because the word psyche comes from the Greek word for soul. So to have a healthy soul, this is what top psychologists say. We need massive doses growing up of respect, encouragement, comfort, security, support, acceptance, approval, appreciation, attention, and affection. Now I know that characterizes every home that you were raised in. Again, listen to that list again. Massive doses of respect, encouragement, comfort, security, support, acceptance, approval, appreciation, attention, and affection. Well, if you're like most of us that are here, we didn't grow up like that. We didn't get all of those things. 
And because when you look at that list, you recognize there's a deficit in me. What we go into relationships looking for is someone to fill that deficit, someone to make up that end. But the relationships are not capable of being able to fill that need because only God can do for us what no one else can do for us. So if you have a Bible, I want you to turn to the Gospel of John. If you're new to Bible reading, just find the New Testament. See, the Bible is not a book. The Bible is a collection of ancient manuscripts. And the first four books, the first four manuscripts that are in the New Testament are four eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus. Now, we're looking for John, who was written by John. They weren't real creative about what they named books in those days, okay? John was a follower of Jesus, probably his closest and most intimate disciple, one who knew him better than anybody else physically. And John talked more about the subject of love than any other of Jesus' followers, any other of his apostles, any other writer of the New Testament. And so John gives it so turn to John chapter 13 and listen, because Jesus stepped into this chaos, this relational minefield that we have in humanity. And here's the reason Jesus came. He came to fix what was broken. And how did he achieve that? How was he about to do that? Because Jesus was going to restore a relationship with God that was characterized and established in love. That's what Jesus came to do. And as a result of that, Jesus gives us the key to lasting relationships. And what's the key to lasting relationships? Jesus taught us to turn what the word love that we usually and generally acclaim as a noun. In other words, something that I fall into, a feeling that I have, something that I experience. He teaches us to turn what we generally uh, assess as a noun into a verb. In other words, to make love a verb. To be a follower of his... To be a child of God, it would require us to make love a verb. Now in John chapter 13, look at verse 34. John chapter 13 and verse 34, Jesus said this. He said a new command. Notice that how he put it. This is not an option. Because it was so central to his work, because it was so critical to our own lives and to the quality of life that he came for you and I to experience, this was not something that he left as an option. This was a command. In fact, if you study the New Testament, which I encourage all of you to do, the Bible is such an awesome book. When you read through the Bible and all of those ends, what you find woven through the New Testament and all the different books that are collected in it, is that really the only command God ever gave us in the New Testament is just one, what Jesus is saying here. Because all other commandments, any other requirement God ever had for humanity is all simplified into the fulfillment of this one simple command. And what was it? A new command I give you. What is that? Love one another. Jesus said, what you normally take is a, as a noun, make it a verb. Love one another. And then he says this. Look at this next part. As I have what? Loved you so you must love one another. And the, the, the order there is critical because their ability to love one another was because why? Because Jesus first loved them. Now, interesting, when Jesus tells us this, he first of all introduces a word that had not existed prior to his coming. The word love is the word agapeo. I put it into your notes. And when you try to find a definition of agapeo, I put it in this way, it's, it's that it's love in a benevolent way because it's hard to describe because why? It had no existence in Greek culture and or, listen, in the Greek Septuagint, which was the Old Testament written in Greek, the word agapeo never existed before. It is a word that is characteristic to Christianity because it first was modeled and understood through Christ. It is, in essence, love as God loves. It is God's love. And here's what I put into your notes. It's important that you recognize this, that this, that the word can only be understood. It can only be known by the actions that it prompts. In other words, agapio can only be understood. It can only be known by the actions for which it prompts, because why? Prior to Christ coming, 
Nobody understood. Even though the Old Testament said, love your neighbor as yourself, Jewish people were confused for years, who is my neighbor? That's why they came and asked Jesus, because they were always trying to boil it down to the lowest common denominator, and what's the least I need to do to try to achieve that end? And so who is my neighbor? And the list got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And Jesus said, listen, to love the way I am telling you means to love your enemy. Nobody ever said that before. Jesus said, if you love people who are nice to you, what difference is there in you than all the other people who are in the world? Because everybody does that. Everybody treats those who are nice to them nice in return. But I'm saying to you that this love is expressed in the ability to love your enemies. That is revolutionary. What are you kidding me? Jesus expressed a love that could only be understood by the actions to which it prompted. And so back to it in, in, in John 13, 34, he said to love one another, notice again, as I have loved you. In other words, not love as you think love should be, but love as I have modeled, as I have demonstrated for you. This is the love that I've given to you. So you must love one another. And you and I need to realize that as a Christian, this is characteristic because to be a follower of Jesus, look at verse 35. Jesus said, by this, by what? Our ability to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if, if you love one another. That's why this is so critical on this end. But to be a child of God, this is what it means. Because when we come to faith in Christ, here's what Jesus restored. God's love was freely given to us. And that's what heals our human heart. That's what restores our life. See, we can't do it in ourselves. But the good news of God, the gospel, was that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever would believe in him. So when we accept the love of God, it does something in us. It changes us from the inside out. The love of God comes to heal our broken heart. And what we receive freely from God is what we are able to give freely because we've received it freely. So therefore, to be a child of God is demonstrated in our ability to love as God, live, uh, God loves. Because why? Because God intended us to live as he lives. And the way that we live as God lives is to love as God loves. And that's why if you're taking notes this morning, listen. First reality that you need to take down. Listen, listen. The ability to love as God loves is the product of the new birth. See, when we are born again, something changes from the inside out. When we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, God performs a miracle inside of us. We are changed. The Bible said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things pass away. All things become new. We become children of God. And what does it mean to be a child of God? It means that now we have the ability to love as God loves. Why? Because we're born of God. And God is love. So our ability to love is because we are children of God. And that's why, look at this verse. In 1 John 3 and verse 14, it says, we know, here's something positive the Bible gives us. Because my question to you would be this. How do you know that you're born again? How do you know that something has changed inside of you? How do you know Okay, that you just didn't have an emotional fit and nothing happened. How do you know that it took, it stuck? What is it? Okay, we know we have passed from what? From death to life. In other words, we're made new. We're changed. How? How do we know it? Because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in what? In death. If you are born again, if you are a child of God, then you have a, the ability to love as God loves. You have the ability to live as God lives. And we can love one another. Why? Because we are born of God. God lives in us, and therefore our ability to do it. In fact, 1 John 4, 7 says it this way. Dear friends, let us love one another. Why? For love comes from God. Get the order and importance. 
See, God gives freely to us. Love comes from God. In other words, it's not something that you have to psych yourself up into. It's not something that you have to have to pretend that you have when you don't have it. You have to recognize love comes from God. And that's why the order is critical. When Jesus was asked the question, what's the greatest commandment? He answered it, but he answered it in twofold reality, and the order was critical. He said to love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, and strength, and, and to love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, if your relationship with God is healthy, then your ability to love others is there. And love comes from God. That's why the order is critical. It's impossible to love other people as God loves without a relationship with God, without maintaining that union with God, because love comes from God. What we need inside of us, God gives to us what no one else can give to us, and what he freely gives. He expects us to freely give in return. See, God doesn't expect us to take in the love of God and just keep it to ourselves. Why? Because the nature of sin is selfishness. It's putting the needs of me above everybody else. God meets our needs, but he does so in a fashion that then we can become children of God to help meet the needs of others because we become the agents of God. See, that's where the, the critical distinction is. God's the one that meets the need. The other person can't meet our need. Why? Because if you put it totally in another person, let me rock your world for a moment, okay? We're going to disappoint you. We're going to hurt you. Why? Because all of us are broken. All of us are a work in progress. We'll all disappoint one another from time to time. That doesn't give us excuses to get away with that, but it's just the facts. God is working on us. But when we put our trust in God, God is the one that meets our need. Whether he does it through people or whether he does it directly, the fact is you can count on God. And when your relationship with God is healthy, then your ability to love others is intact and healthy. Why? Because he said it again in John 1 John 4, 7. He says this. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves, what? Has been born of God and knows God. The more you love others, the more your relationship with God grows. That's why to walk with God means to love other people. It's not just about you and God. It's about what God can do through you. And that's how he builds lives. That's how he does. So again, our ability to love as God loves is the product of the new birth. But that leads me to the second reality, if you're taking notes, is this. Is that love grows only if exercised. Love grows only if exercised. And guys, can I ask you a question? Have you ever gone to fix something in your home, something in your yard, and realized, man, you need a tool? And then you're like, wow, I'm going to have to go get a tool because I don't have the tool. And then you realize after you went and bought it, you already had it. I mean, that's happened to me. It just happened to me recently again. Why? Because we have stuff that sometimes we forget we have. Let me better illustrate it to you this way. When I was in college... I was in great shape because I was a soccer player. I, play, I played soccer all the time. It was more than a sport to me. It was a passion. I was looking to make it a vocation. And on average, I ran back then in those days, on average, 15 miles a day and sprinted and everything. I played soccer every day. So I was in really, really good shape. And I remember I got into the discussion with these girls who were friends of mine in school. Not girlfriends, girls who were friends. You got to get the differential, okay? <laughs> And we got into this thing because they were athletes as well, and they invited me to come work out with them. And they were going to do an aerobic workout. Now, in my mind, I'm like, that's girly exercise. Come on. That's no big deal. And we got into this big debate. They're like, will you come and work out with us? I'm like, Shh, no problem. Then you come and work out with us. I'll show you a real workout, right? Because we were going to the gym and listen. So I went to this workout. My friend and I, we went to work out with these girls. We get into this aerobic workout, and I'm going, wow, there really is something to this. I'm really having to keep up. I'm not going, wow, that's, that's serious work. I changed my mind, changed my thinking, okay, on this end. But the reality is the next morning, I woke up <laughs> sore in places that I didn't even know I had muscles. I walked around. My butt was all sweaty, and I was having to walk like this. I was like, I didn't even know you had muscles in your butt. I never worked those out in the gym. I never had that experience. And I was so sore because here's the point. All the time I had those muscles, 
but I had never exercised them. And the fact is, you all possess the love of God. The question is, have you ever exercised it? Have you ever done something with what God has freely given to you? It's there, we have it, but it only works for us when we exercise it. Again, making love a verb is about what you do. It's not just how you feel, it's what you do. So the question is, what are you doing with the love of God. It requires action. It requires doing something with it. In fact, look at this. 1 John 3, 18 says this. Dear children, let us not love with words. Aren't we great at that? Love your brother. We come to church. Oh, love your brother. Okay? Until they cut us off trying to leave the parking lot. Okay? Okay? Love your sister until she wears the dress that I'm wearing that I thought I was the only one that had one. Oh, you mean that doesn't happen to you? I must be in the wrong church. No, the reality of it is, okay, love is in action. Dear children, let us not love in words, but what? Or speech, but in actions and in truth. Real love is displayed not in what somebody says to you, but what they do for you. See, a lot of people say, I'm there for you, brother. But what you really know they love you is when they are there for you. When they show up and not just tell you that they're coming. You see, we recognize it. Isn't that what we really want ultimately? Not people to give us lip service. We want people to actually be there. He said, let us not love in words or speech, but what? In actions and in truth. You have to exercise. I know that is a dirty word here in church. Exercise. Oh my goodness. It's like God expects with the body that he gave us, we do something with it. More than just pray for it. We need to actually take care of it, which means we should honor it in what we eat. We should actually engage in exercise. I'm sorry if that's offensive, but the truth is, you gotta work with what you got, and what you got might turn into what you want it to be. That's the problem. So you gotta do something with what God's given to you, love, needs to be a verb because look at this, Romans 5, 13, 8, he says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt of love one for another. For whoever loves has fulfilled the law. In other words, if we would just center on this reality, anything God has ever given or expected us to do can all be assessed in this reality, love your neighbor as yourself. Because if you love me, you won't lie to me. If you love me, you won't steal from me. If you love me, you won't murder me. Okay? Anything God has ever given as a moral imperative can all be wrapped up into that reality. If we just centered on exercising love, we would fulfill anything that God's ever required of us to do. Which leads me to our next point. Listen, look at this. Healthy relationships are less about choosing the right people. Why? Because the first reality that we come to whenever there's a problem, we say, it's their problem. You know, the friends that I had, that was the problem. I had the wrong friends. It was that group of people. We're in a marriage and we say, man, it ain't going right. You know why it ain't going right? Because I'm married to the wrong one. The problem is I got the wrong person. I need to exchange it. I need to get a new one. Or we say, you know what? I, I, the problem is my church. It's the people in my church. I need a new church. I need a new group of people. It's those people over there. They're the problem. Healthy relationships are less about choosing the right people and more about choosing to be the right person. One who loves like Christ. See, we constantly want to put the attention on what everybody else is doing. And the question from God is, what are you doing? How are you using the love of God? What could be different? How could your relationships actually change if you were to exercise the love of God in you? If you did something with it, because see, with exercise, you grow stronger, how? By doing it. The more you do it, you see, the more resistant you become, because why? You know, it's kind of like with lifting weights, strength is assessed, because what? Stuff that used to weigh you down, the stronger you get, you're able to push it off. And the fact is, the stronger you get in love, what people do in your life is less about holding you down and more about strengthening you in God. You recognize that every time somebody acts unlovely is an exercise opportunity for me to grow in God, to demonstrate and allow Christ to be formed in me, that I can live like God and experience, because here's what God's intention was. 
that we would experience life as he lives it. It's a quality of life that God invites us into if we learn to love like he loves. And so we need to recognize it's less about choosing the right people and more about choosing to be the right person. Why? Because that's what you can control. So you can't control what other people do. You can't even control what your spouse does, what your kids do. The thing that you can control is what you do. See, when somebody does something to you, that doesn't have to change your attitude. It's what you do with what they do to you that affects your attitude, that determines your outlook, that makes your day either good or bad. See, when you choose to be the right person, in other words, you choose to exercise the love of God to learn to love like Christ loved. And so that's why it says to us, listen, 1 John 4, 11 says this, dear friends, since God so loved us, notice this, we ought, notice this, ought. In other words, this is optional. We all have the choice. Just because we have the ability to doesn't mean that we're going to. Just because God gave it to us doesn't mean we're going to do anything with it. Don't we have tons of stuff that way? We buy stuff. We stuff stuff in our house. You've got tons of stuff in your household that you bought that you never use. It's stuffed in closets. It's stuffed in basements. It's stuffed everywhere. In fact, we need more places to stuff our stuff with stuff we never use. And so it is with Christ. God gives us more stuff, but we don't even use the stuff that we have. And God's saying, how could it be different if you actually did? We ought to love one another. What difference might it make if you actually began to love one another. Because why? Romans 5.5 5 tells us this. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love, notice this, has been poured out into our hearts. God's not cheap. God's not stingy. He's constantly pouring everything that we need. The problem is never with God. The problem is using what you have. He said, it's been poured out where? In our hearts. It's there but do you use what you've been given? It's been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit has been given to us right there. See, that's what it means to be a child of God. The first fruit of the Spirit, in other words, what does the Holy Spirit produce in us? The very first reality is love. We are all capable of producing this consistently because that's what it means to be a child of God. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Therefore, if we made love a verb, we would take and use what God's given to us. So, thank God, God gave the Apostle Paul this responsibility. Because Jesus came along and told us, love one another. Then God raised up the Apostle Paul to help us to understand what does this love look like in real time? How does it act? How does the love of God manifest itself? What does it do? What does it actually look like when it's exercised? What does God's love look like in the midst of a relationship. And so that's why in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, the Apostle Paul comes along by the Holy Spirit, tells us exactly, this is how God's love acts. If we were to look at this alone and just commit this to our own hearts and recognize this is God's 10, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says this. And notice all of it is love is. In other words, it's an action. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's something that you... Do. Why? Because God intended that in our lives, love would be a verb. Love is what? Patient. Love is patient. That means leaving the parking lot. Love is patient. That means when people don't do what you anticipated or thought they would do, love is patient. Love is kind. Some people are patient, but they're not very kind. They hate to wait. Okay? Love is patient and love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. Can I break that down for you? It does not boast. In other words, when you're talking, you're not the first subject and the majority of all that you're talking about. That's why some people ain't got nothing else to say. The bottom line is when you love like God loves, engaging in what's going on in the lives of other people is essential. Why? Because it doesn't boast. It's not proud. Look at verse 5. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. In other words, it's not all about what I need. It's about what can I do to help you. See, the love of God is living for the benefit of others. 
The, it, it reverses the order, actually corrects the order of what God intended to be. Because we look at love as to what we want to receive, where God looks at it on the opposite spectrum and says, this is what you can give. And it's in your giving that you receive what you need. So we're waiting to receive it before we do anything. And we have this showdown that happens in relationships. Well, I'll do when they do. And God said, no, 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 no. You've got this wrong. Love is a verb. What are you doing? If you're waiting for somebody else, then you're not exercising what you've been given. Love does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not, listen, it's not easily angered. You know, it doesn't... It doesn't get irritated and upset. That's awesome. If you've got a teenager in your household, it's great to remember. Love is not easily angered. Can I get an amen? It's all the opportunity to recognize God works in us. And that's how it looks. It's not easily angered. And here, look at this one. It keeps no record of wrongs. What? Are you kidding me? You know it as well as I do. Whenever there's relational tension, we pull out the list. Do you know what you did? And we can tell you to accurate details 10 years, 20 years, 30 years ago. Do you remember when you did? You knew where you were, what happened to every little bit of a detail, even down to the contortion of their face. You could tell it and and you got the list and the list goes on. But hear what? Love means burning the list. Love means keeping no list. It means erasing the tape. It means burning the calculator. It means getting rid of all the stuff that you want to bring up again and again and again. That doesn't, that's not love. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Verse six, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Why? Because verse seven, it always, notice it said always. Not most of the time. Isn't that how we gauge ourselves? Well, you know, most of the time I do that. Well, I'm usually this way. No, but love always protects. It always trusts. You know, why is it when something didn't go our way, immediately our mind goes into suspicion mode? Well, they must be doing, and you have your list. No, love always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. In other words, guys, that's the love of God. You say, well, if that's the love of God, what am I? You feel sunk. If that's how God's love acts, I would dare say most of us here probably don't have the best track record in it. But here's the point. You can't get overwhelmed. When you talk about exercise, one of the reasons people don't exercise is because we look at the end result and we say, oh my goodness, I could never be and therefore we do nothing. When the fact is this, when you want to get in shape and the more out of shape that you are becomes more discouraging. But the truth is this, you just start somewhere. You just begin with one thing. And if you're faithful with that one thing, you'll find that you get stronger, you get better. And the more you do it, the better you get and the more in shape you get. And you realize that what you think you couldn't do before, now all of a sudden you can do more than you ever thought you could do before. So here's the point, guys, because listen, Pick one area where you're weak. So when you start to work out wherever you're weak, you start exercising it. And you may get sore. Is it easy? No. But you stay at it and you know this. I will gain strength. I'll be able to blow through this and stretch myself and do more and more and more. You start one place. Why? If you're taking notes, listen, listen, listen. For relationships to remain strong, we need to make love a verb. In other words, it's about what you do. Let me help you in this respect. It's kind of like your bank account. If you go to make withdrawals and you never put any deposits in, that's why most of your relationships are NFS. You know what I mean by that? Non-sufficient funds. Because you ain't made no deposits. All we're looking for in relationships is to make withdrawals. And the fact is, God said, no, no, no. Reverse the order. You got to deposit. Love is a verb. It's about what you do consistently. See, the Lord's been dealing with me recently about this idea of investing. You know, I used to be an investment broker, and the Lord's reminded me on this front because, listen, investments deal with continual and consistent investment. Okay? If you want your future security to grow 
then you need to invest wisely. And if you want the security of your relationships to grow, if you want your relationships to be able to, to stand the test of time, then you need to regularly invest. You need to constantly, and God will cause the interest. God will cause the increase. But, if, but listen, it's kind of like the Chinese, uh, uh, um, uh, um, when you go to bring your, your, your clothes in to be washed or to, you know, to the dry cleaner, they tell you, no tiki, no washi. Okay? In other words, if you don't give anything, you ain't got nothing to take out. You got to invest. You got to do something. So here's the point, guys. Love is a verb. It's about what you do. So here, think through. What are you doing? Where can you begin? Just take that list in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4 through 7. Listen. That's something that you should take out, write out for yourself. I put it in your notes, take it in your Bible. There's a lot of scriptures I went over today because this is the point. I don't want you to just come here and listen and go, oh, that was good and go home. What I'm hoping is that you'll take it home, crack the book for yourself, go through it, get this in you and believe this. You can do it. You can make love a verb. Just start someplace. Take one of those areas. Where do you struggle the most? Where are you the most weak in relationships. Are you not patient? Then begin to exercise a plan. See, whenever somebody starts exercising, the first thing they do is develop an exercise regimen. And what you need to do, take just one area. Don't get discouraged. Don't get overwhelmed. Just one part. Some of you, you need to say, I need to get rid of my list. I need to stop taking account of things that have been done wrong to me. I need to forget all that. I need to give up all that. I need to get over all that. I need to go on from all that. Start in just one place. Listen to me. And then do this. Get alone with God and come up with a plan. How are you going to exercise this truth? You see, before a pilot goes out and flies, the first thing they do is stick him in a flight simulator. In other words, they think through, that causes them to go through it. And in your time alone with God, think about what might come up when you begin to exercise love. You know it. When you begin to say, you know what? I'm going to go into my workplace and all the rest of those flea bit environments, I'm going to start to act in love. I'm going to begin to love other people in my world that I work with, that I have, you know, that I'm neighbors with or some other situation. And you know as well as I do, why do they stick a pilot Behind a simulator, because they're going to face turbulence, and they need to know what to do when that situation comes up. And therefore, when you're alone with God, you can already predict where the turbulence is going to come, and you begin to make a plan. You need to be able to stick steadfast to it. The reality is this. You start exercising somewhere. Pick an area. Pick a thing and say, I am going to begin to work out a plan to exercise this. Will you be perfect at it immediately? No. Like nobody who works out. You come home sore. You come home feeling like, wow, this is tough. But the truth is, if you stick with it, you gain strength. You gain endurance. And your ability to know God increases. Your relationship with God grows. And just imagine what might your relationships look like if you began to make love a verb. The other thing you do is this. You begin to take the word of God and confess the truth. Why is confession so important? Because we're so ready to believe the lie. See, so many things will come into our minds to talk us out and say, you can't do that. I don't care what Pastor Ken says. You can't do that. That's just unrealistic. That's not something you're capable of doing. But that's a lie. God's word says, and therefore, when I begin to agree with God, it unlocks that, that God's ability to work in me is the first achieved by agreeing with God. That's why confessing the truth, I can love because I'm born of God. Love resides inside of me. I have this. I can do it. And therefore, I will have the courage and the fortitude to begin to act like what God said is true. And the more you do, the stronger you get. You begin to act on it. That's what I want to... So as I close, listen to me. Imagine with me for a moment what your relationships might look like if you began to make love a verb. If you began to exercise the love that God's put inside of you in some fashion, in some way, to act like Jesus, to be who you were created by God, 
to be. To begin to love others with the love that God has given you. What difference might that make in your relationships? What difference might that have in the quality of the life that you presently lead? May it give you the ability to live beyond your current uh, 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 circumstances. What might it look like if I began to live life as God lives it? What might I experience? What might my life be like? What might the quality of my life be like if I began to love as God loves? If I began to make love a verb? Here's the deal. What do you have to lose? What would it really cost you if you actually took something today and determined right now to leave this place and do something? with what you heard. To go away and say, you know what? I'm gonna find an area and I'm gonna begin to do something. I'm not gonna sit and listen anymore. I am going to determine today that the quality of my life, I want to raise. I want to experience life as God intended me to live it. Therefore, I am determined today to make love a verb. It's about what I do and I'm gonna come up with a plan. I'm gonna put the word of God in my mouth and I'm gonna exercise the love that God's put in me. What might my life look like? What might the quality of the life I experience be like if I literally had the courage today to make love a verb?